going to be talking about the value of people this morning, and specific people. We'll get there in just a moment. Um, I want to welcome you guys. My name's Tim. I'm the lead pastor here, and, and, uh, and we've been in a series called Nine Things That Matter, and we're going through the, the books of First and Second Timothy, Paul's letters to this young pastor in the small church. Not really small church. It's actually a very influential church in Ephesus. And, uh, and we're learning some things, and we've learned some things as we've gone through this. And just real quickly, the things we've talked about so far is the idea of leaving a legacy, like Paul left with Timothy, a spiritual legacy, that we're called as Christians to continue that spiritual legacy and in investing in people. We talked about biblical teaching and biblical servant leadership. Those were pretty important when you think about the life of a church, because there's so often whenever there is um, uh, what I would say false doctrines taught in different places, in different churches, with false teachers who are trying to earn and trying to win and trying to uh, gain influence and, and really control and lead over people. And that's not God's dream of the church. He gave leaders and his words so that we could walk into biblical teaching, understanding it, the richness and depth of it, right? And biblical leadership, which leads with humility, with a servant's heart, just as Christ led. He came and he served. He didn't come to, to be served. And we see that example of humble servant leadership. And that's the idea of biblical servant leadership in the church. The pastors and elders and those in leadership are there to serve the body, to raise up the body of Christ so that you can be equipped to use your gifts in the body of Christ, right? And last week we talked about the Browns and the Steelers. And who was here last week, right? Um, and that wasn't the main point of the sermon, all right? But the, the main point was this whole idea of loyalty. And, and we're talking about Browns fans who are just loyal to the Browns no matter what. You know, they're... It really has to be no matter what, you know, because that's what they're in for. And, and, uh, and, and what we were talking about, loyalty to the gospel, that, that Paul is encouraging Timothy and the church to remain loyal to the truth and the essentialness of the foundation of the gospel, what Jesus did for us, right? And also being loyal to the church body. He, he was, Paul was proclaiming to Timothy, would you come to me? Would you be with me? And this loyalty that he had in relationship as others left and scattered and moved and and he's like, be loyal to both of those things, the gospel, and be loyal to each other in the body of Christ, and walk into that. And so this morning, though, um, we are, um, we are, I'm, phew, t- this is a difficult topic I get to preach on this morning. Actually, this week and next week are going to be interesting, all right, to say the least, all right, because we're, we're in a two-parter that's called God, Sex, and Gender Roles, all right? And, and I know some of you are like, what's Tim going to say? You're excited to see what's going to happen um, and how this is going to go. And just so you know, this sermon this morning, God has been working in me on this for the last three years and really helping me walk through a journey of what we're talking about this morning because we're talking about a passage in Timothy that's pretty controversial in, in and amongst even Christian scholars. They argue back and forth about this one. And, uh, and so this morning, I'm going to present really a bunch of different sides uh, to the discussion and then I'm going to share where God's taken me. And, and again, that's just me. So I try to teach truth, and here's truth. And then when I say it's Tim's opinion, I let you know, right? This is Tim's opinion, and you can take it for what it's worth. Uh, but this morning, we are going to be talking about this. The, the thing that matters the, out of these nine things that we're talking about is that women matter, okay? Um, so we have fill-in-the-blanks. If you have fill-in-the-blanks, uh, or if you have your worship program, we always provide sermon notes. You can follow along. I'm going to be in a bunch of different passages this morning, um, so if you want to flip to those passages as I go through them, you can. If you want to go back this week and read them and go through it and study yourself, I would encourage you, as I always do, to do that and go deeper into these topics that we talk about on Sundays. Um, but but the, the thing I want to start with is the foundation of the conversation for the next two weeks, okay? Um, because if we don't have the, the first filter in place, um, that's when things go south real quick. That's where opinions start growing. That's where, that's where lines get divided. And that's where the enemy always comes in and divides the church. Whenever these kind of topics come into play, and it's like, like these are the topics that split denominations that we're talking about. Like entire like, groups of churches said, we're going this way and we're going this way. And, and, uh, and so I want us to start through the very first filter that all of us start everything through as Christ followers. And it is through the filter of the great commandment. The great commandment is this. Jesus was, was challenged. Let me go back. Jesus was challenged by the, the religious leaders in that time, and they kept trying to, like, trip him up in his theology. And, like, I think Jesus had pretty good theology. Like, he understood who God was uh, pretty well, you know? Like, he was God. So he knew what he was talking about. And so they were trying to trip him up, and they said, well, then what's the greatest commandment? You get in the Old Testament, all these laws, all these rules, I mean, just books and books of them. And Jesus comes back to the simplicity I love how he simplifies the gospel and he simplifies the message. It doesn't make it easier. It actually makes it more difficult. 
because this is what he says. And Jesus replied, the greatest commandment, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, right? This is the first and greatest commandment. Greatest, that means it's, it's, it takes higher priority than any other one, he says. And the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law of, and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So this is, that's the big one, right? Jesus is like, everything else you read, everything you, you filter through through Scripture, everything that you learn about how to walk like a Christ follower, you know, and walk as a disciple of Christ, all of it starts with that filter of love. Love is the biggest filter. That's the first one. The foundation of Christian faith is love. It's love. So anything that comes out and it, and it isn't love, um, that's where our red flags go off. That's where we're like, is there false teaching? Is there a false prophet? Or is there just either ignorance or, or is there preference? Like all sorts of things come into play into these difficult topics we're talking about. And, uh, and so I want us, as we talk about this together and this and next Sunday, to start with that. Our foundation in any conversation is that God called us to first love him with, with all that we got. It's our mind, our body, soul, our strength, everything that's in us. Our call is to love God. And then the second is, a lot like it, and love your neighbor. And do you know who your neighbor is? It's not the one that lives next to you, okay? But they are included. Um, but it's everybody. It's, it's whoever's close to you. That's your neighbor. He says, love everyone around you. So love God and love others. And that's the filter that we're going to use to talk about these topics, okay? Is everybody with me? All right. So if anything unloving happens, I'm calling you on it, okay? Because that's that's our main command, you know. That's what we're called to do. Now, now in this, my desire in the conversation we're going to have today is not a desire to divide. That, that's not the desire, okay? Um, that has been what's happened in the past with, with, we're talking about women in life and in leadership and all sorts of different things, and in culture. Uh, it, it has created divides, and I think the enemy uses those divides for his purposes, and, and, and I think it goes against God's purposes. Um, when we think about the church as a whole, the greater church, there are some differences in belief in some, some doctrines. Um, but, but I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase. It's been in different, different denominations to use this phrase, but I agree with it. I think no matter where we come from um, in our faith, that we need to have unity on the essentials. And on the non-essentials, we have liberty. There's freedom. And, and that's the thing with Scripture. There are those things that are absolutes. Like, there are doctrines that, like, if you mess with that one, you're going completely out of Scripture. And those essentials that we walk in are, are the Trinity, that God is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? Let's talk about salvation through grace alone. It's not by works. That's a foundational belief in faith, in our Christian faith, that Jesus came, he walked, he lived, he died, he conquered death and rose again. That's non-negotiable. That happened that paid the price for our freedom and salvation. These are the essentials of the faith. I can walk alongside any other believer who says, I agree with those. But they may have some things over here that they read and be like, but this one, I don't know if we're on the same page with. And I'm like, that's okay. As long as we're walking with each other in love with it, I'm cool with that. We can wrestle with one another. I, that's awesome. The moment you start getting angry at me and start like, or I get angry at you and all of a sudden it becomes self-protection and it becomes like, now we're getting into sin issues, right? Because there's something else that got poked inside of us, our own pride, our own protection, our own hurts and wounds from the past, all those things. And so we need to be careful as we filter this that it's not through our own wounds, hurts, and past. We want to filter through God's word today, okay? But no matter what, I know you're going to do that because <laughs> we're humans, because we have hurts, wounds, and pasts. And, and I would say, especially the women in the room, as I'm going to be preaching about you, you have very specific wounds and hurts and, 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 uh, and things in your past, and, um, and I'm, I'm praying for you during this conversation that God might even start loosening those up and maybe even start releasing you from some of those. So here at New Hope, we're going to have absolute unity on the essentials. But, even, but there will be things that we will have liberty with one another that we might think differently, and we may read different passages. Here's the thing. There are passages in the Scripture that for generations, biblical scholars have studied over and over and over again, and there's still two or three different camps on that same topic. You think, well, wouldn't they have figured it out by now? Obviously, God didn't want us to have a solid, direct answer, and he left it up to interpretation with some of this stuff. 
You know, it could be like how, how you do baptisms. Different churches have different ways of doing baptisms. We're going to be celebrating that today. And some sprinkle, some dunk, some do three, some do one, some do. It's like, just get you wet, all right? Like, that's, like, that's where I stand. Like, like it's the whole, it's, that's the whole idea. Um, and we can differ on that, but we believe no matter the way you're getting dunked, Jesus saved you, right? It's by God's grace. So there's, there's this liberty in some of these modes or ideas um, as long as they're filtered through the idea of love, of love. So I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to, today's teaching. So everybody ready for teaching? Um, so I'm going to give you a filter to struggle with difficult passages and help you to learn how to do that on your own if you want to and, and wrestle with different things because the passage we're going to be talking about is, is a difficult one. Um, so, so when you're dealing with difficult passages that, that you read and you're like, what? Like, huh? That doesn't make any sense to me. Like those kind of passages, and maybe you read another passage, you're like, but that says something different than that one. So how does that line up? It doesn't mean that God didn't put it in there for a reason. It's in there for a reason. And typically when we filter that, we have to filter it through a lens, right? First one is love, because that's the ultimate command. And then when we deal with difficult passages, we need to deal with it in this. We, we have to think about the context of what we're reading, the culture that that was written to at the time, and we got to think about consistency. Like this theme, what does it look like throughout the entire Bible? Not just this one verse. Because if, if you miss out on this, you can really easily take one passage, pull it out of context, and then create a whole doctrine around it that could be completely wrong because it was towards a culture and it's not consistent with the entirety of the scriptures, right? Um, and so we have to be very careful as we study the Word of God that we're looking at it in context, not taking passages out of the context, but reading it as a whole. Most of the New Testament is written as a letter from a, an apostle or a disciple um, to a church or a specific person. And as we're reading it, they were, re, re, they were writing it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, meaning God was the author, they were the writers, and and in that, they were writing to a specific context, to a specific person in a specific culture. And, and, and the thing that's crazy with the whole whole of the Bible, with all these authors and how long it was written, there is a consistency in the message from beginning to end, which for me proves the, the legitimacy of the Word of God, that God, didn't, God is God through the whole story, and His story is redemption from beginning to end. So we have to think about it in this context— and then when we read it, we have to read it and ask ourselves, is what I'm reading right now prescriptive or is it descriptive? And, and what I'm reading, like, are they just describing what happened or a circumstance or something like that? Or were they being de uh, prescriptive, meaning when you do it, do it this way every time, right? So the great commandment was prescriptive, right? He's like, I'm prescribing you to love everyone and love God. Like, that's it. There's no, like, I wasn't describing, this is one way to possibly do it. He's like, no, this is what you do. I'm prescribing this to you. But then you think about when Jesus taught on the Lord's Prayer. He said, he said to his disciples, when you pray, pray like this. He said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You know, your kingdom come. And, all. And, he, and he did a very specific prayer. Now, does that mean every single time you pray, you have to pray that very specific prayer? And if not, you're not praying. No. He was being descriptive. When you pray, here's a way to pray. Here's a model to pray, because then we read all throughout the other scriptures all sorts of different kinds of prayers. We're told, pray on all occasions with all kinds of prayers, with thanksgiving. And, and so, like, he was being descriptive on, this is a way to pray. The prescription was pray, right? But the, the description was, and this is a way to do it. You read the Psalms. David was praying with his heart and just pouring his guts out to God, right? You get to the New Testament, they say pray with thanksgiving and joy and worship. And so you see all different kinds of prayer, prescriptive or descriptive, okay? Is everybody with me? All right, because we're like in Bible school now, right? <laughs> we're like, because we're, we have to be with what we're, what we're learning, what we're discussing today. So we're going to look at the topic today through the context, meaning we don't just pull it out and be like, well, that's our doctrine. We have to look at the context of the letter, uh, that, that Paul wrote to Timothy. We have to look at the culture, what was happening in Ephesus, what was happening in the church in Ephesus, what was going on inside of that church, because Paul was writing to Timothy for a reason, because things were going south, and teachers were being false teachers, and, and, uh, and all sorts of things were happening. So Paul was writing for a specific reason in that culture to Timothy in Ephesus, and then we have to take that through the lens, and this is where good doctrine comes from, consistency throughout the whole scriptures. Where does this fit in to the whole story? 
how does this work with these passages and this passage and 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 how does the bible prove the bible is what you're that's what you're doing okay all right now that we have that out of the way now let's talk about this easy subject um which is the role of women in life in church all right this is an easy one love them all right let's go home <laughs> right like if we if we the simple answer is the great commandment like men and women we're called to love one another as Christ loved us. We're, we're called to love God and then love each other. Wouldn't it be great if it was that easy? It's not. There's so much cultural influences. There's so, there's so much uh, just this, this messiness in relationship, the, the different cultures. I mean, you take this passage that we're going to read in a minute, and you take it to all sorts of different cultures around the world. Women are treated different ways in different cultures and different points throughout history. The time this was written in, in the early century church um, women were pretty devalued. Like women and kids in Jesus' time were like, ah, we're lesser than. There was a prayer that, that the Jewish leaders would pray, and the prayer was, thank goodness we're not women or children. <laughs> like, well, that's bad, right? Like, like, that's a really bad prayer. Don't do that one, okay? Um, that was the culture, though. And, uh, and, and so we see this passage written in this time of history that we're going to read, but then we also see this consistent word and this consistency in, in how women were treated by Jesus and in the church. And we can't confuse this. We have to understand this really, really well, okay? So I'm starting with a passage at the end of, of uh, the books in Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Uh, in in uh, 2 Timothy is the, the last, we think one of the last letters that, that Paul wrote, because he gets really personal at the end, and he knows his time is coming to an end. Here on this earth. And so he's writing to Timothy, his, his son in the faith, and, and he's reminding him of, of who he is and what he's doing and why he's doing it. And, uh, and he says this uh, to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, 3 through 5. He says, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. I rec recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. You see this just awesome relationship, right? This mentoring, this, this you're my son in the faith, man, I, I want to be, be with you, Timothy. He says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. So at the beginning of this letter, he's reminding Timothy of his spiritual heritage. He's reminding him, you, you come from a lineage of faith. And now I'm persuaded you have that same faith and you're living it on. It's interesting in this beginning of chapter 2, the people that have influenced Timothy the most, as Paul as his spiritual father is speaking to him, he's saying the two people I've seen the most in faith is your grandmother Lois, who's a girl, and your mother Eunice, also a girl, right? Like He's like, your spiritual legacy was based upon the women in your life. Now, we don't know Timothy's dad. We don't know the full story of Timothy's dad. We know he was a Greek, and, but we don't even know if he was a Christ follower. We don't know what he did or how he walked. What we do know is his grandma and his mama knew Jesus, and they had a faith in God, and they spoke that into Timothy's life, and it influenced Timothy now to where Paul's saying, I see that same faith in you. Keep pressing on, right? See, right at the very beginning of this letter, we see Paul's heart, okay? We see Paul's heart, because this is Paul's heart. Paul honors godly women. All throughout his letters, we see Paul honoring godly women. He doesn't, like, put them in the back and say, you know, your faith is your own, Timothy. You did it all by yourself, or, boy, thank goodness I was in your life because you didn't have a dad who was, so honor me, you know? Like, that, that wasn't it. He gave honor where honor was due, and he said, man, your grandma and your mom, they loved God, and their faith was strong, and now it is strong in you. That's, that's a picture. That's an image of honor. I mean, A, to be listed in Scripture is a pretty big deal, and we've seen some names listed because they did the stupid stuff, right? And then we see some that are honored because they were walking with God, they were serving, and they were, they were doing what they ought to do, and this is one of those moments his, his grandma and his mom just got honored forever in Scripture for the influence in Timothy's life and faith. That's a big deal. That's a real big deal. 
Actually, we see this kind of, this, this spirit of Paul speaking about this all throughout the scriptures. Um, I'm going to go into the book of Romans. Because of this topic, we're going to be in a lot of different passages, not just Timothy, okay? Because the book of Romans, is, it's a deep theological book. He was presenting the gospel, the legitimacy of the gospel of Jesus' work to the Jews, and he's trying to win them over to what Jesus has done. I mean, it's a thick, rich uh, book of the Bible. Someday I will preach on it when I'm smart enough, okay? Uh, when I get there, we'll get there, okay? Um, and in this passage, we get to, to the end of the book of Romans, and Paul is just start thanking people. He's like thanking for people that worked with him, people in the church, people. And, uh, and it's interesting because at the very end of this list, there are at least 10 women listed in the influence in the church, in the body, and in Paul's life. We're talking about Paul honors godly women, right? And we see this example. We're looking at consistency through Scripture. He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Century, if that's how you pronounce it. Our sister Phoebe, and this isn't from Friends Phoebe, all right? This is a different Phoebe. Um, This is really interesting because the person who brought the letter to the, the church in Rome was a woman. It was Phoebe. She was the carrier of the letter, and then those that carried and brought the letter to the church at that time were the ones that would answer the questions about that letter to that church. And Paul calls her a deacon. That's a spiritual leadership role in the church. Interesting that one of the most complicated and like deep, rich theological um, books of the Bible, he first commends Phoebe at the end and says this. He says, I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Let's keep reading. It says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risk their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Now, this is an interesting one, too, because he goes from Phoebe straight to Priscilla and Aquila. This is a wife and a husband who are leading the church. It says they lead the church in their house together. And culturally, it would be the man listed before the woman. And many of the scholars believe, well, Priscilla must have been the key leader in the church, and Aquila was there to help and support. It's interesting. But no matter what, he calls Priscilla and Aquila his co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risk. He's not separating the two. He's honoring a woman in the church for her work. He says, greet also the church that meets at their house, at a Priscilla and Aquila's house. Greet my clear, or my dear friend uh, Eponidas, who was the first convert to Christ in the province of Asia. Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. So Mary was doing something in the church and working for them. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my fellow Jews who have been in prison with me. They're outstanding among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. Andronicus is a guy named Junia is a girl name and he's he's commending both of them for their work alongside him and he calls them outstanding among the apostles it's interesting both a man and a woman called out to say they've they've been my co-workers they are outstanding among the apostles labeling a woman an apostle now I'm telling you we're talking about controversial stuff here because some of you in this room you're already like I don't like where Tim's going with this I'm Let's filter this through love. All I'm doing is reading scripture, right? And then he keeps going. He says, I also want uh, the women. Oh, no, no, no. This is where we get controversial. Okay. Let me push the pause button. <laughs> right? So the first, first thing I want to talk about is, is we see this consistency with Paul honoring godly women, right? He did it in Timothy. He did it for Timothy's grandmother and mother. He, we see it in the book of Romans. We see a, a, a lot of the letters. Are, uh, there's a lot of thank yous to the women who have co-worked beside me in the ministry, who have been useful for the church. And so he paints this picture of honor. And then we do. We get to this moment now, after we see he's honoring godly women, and we read a passage like this. Now into 1 Timothy chapter 2. This is the controversial passage in culture. And, and has created a divide amongst churches. Because it says this. It says, I also want the women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, adorning themselves not with elaborate hairstyles or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. So right now, that's actually not that bad, right? You're like, what, what he's 
speaking to is a situation. Obviously, the women that were showing up to church in Ephesus were dressed into the nines, and they weren't in it for the right reason. They were trying to show themselves off, which actually became a distraction to the rest of the church as they're trying to have an order of worship. See, we see Paul teaches there's, there's orderly worship. God is not a God of confusion. God creates order for a reason. And so in this passage at the beginning, he's talking about how men should pray and what it should look like in the order and all that, and then he gets to this conversation with, with the women in the church. So they were obviously like showing off and dressing up. And he said, actually, it's not about the outside, right? It's about the good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. He's talking about the inside. The godly women have something inside of them that they don't have to show it off or show themselves off on the outside. And then he gets controversial. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety. Whoa. Now we're confused, right? Like, okay, so you were honoring the women who had faith and led in faith and even had spiritual roles and leadership in the church, and now you're saying, Paul, now I, I want them to all stay quiet and just be full submissive and just go home and talk to their husbands. Which is it? This is messy, isn't it? This is really, this, this is why we need to look at the whole picture of Scripture. Context, culture, consistency throughout the whole Scripture. We need to look prescriptive and descriptive. What's going on then? That Paul honors women, but now this sounds a little dishonoring, doesn't it? It's like, just, just be quiet and go home. Like, that's what it sounds like. Actually, there was a, no, I'm not going to go there. No, I need to. Because there was a spiritual leader uh, that made a comment to a godly woman, and that's what's his direct words, go home. And I'm like, who are you? Who are you? Somebody who's been esteemed in the faith and has their own study Bibles and all sorts of stuff, and an author. And yet he missed the first filter, which is love. There's a problem there, right? Whenever we miss that first filter and we just go straight to reaction, um, sin enters in. That's when opinion trumps truth. And, uh, and, and we can't do that. that, that was, it was wrong. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's okay. If, if some of you have kind of followed what goes on in the, in the Christian world, um, I'd say stop it and just read your Bible. Because <laughs> it's just so much junk out there, so much junk that wastes our time and energy, um, that wastes our time and energy. See, see Paul, as he's, as he's talking about this, I, I, I'm just going to get into it, the, the teachings, okay? Because the discussion in, in the scholarly world and, and uh, throughout different camps um, believe two, two different ends when it comes to this idea of women's roles in life and in ministry, okay? And so uh, if you have your notes, you can take some notes, but, but these are the fancy words, all right? These are the, like the big words um, that's used and, and the way they, they view these. So the one is called complementarian view of how women and, 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 uh, and men relate to each other, and one is called egalitarian. Now, this has nothing to do with just saying good co compliments to each other or like the study of eagles, okay? It's neither of those. Um, the complementarians believe that God created man first, and women were a complement to complement the gifting of the man. And so there's a beside the man mentality to the complementarianism, okay? And then the egalitarian says there's absolute and total equality between men and women. There are no differences. And, and when we went to the New Testament, God shifted that view of women in relationship and marriage and all that kind of stuff. Now, now, now let me get to some specifics so we can understand this bigger view of, of this challenge that we're talking about. Both of them, both, both beliefs, believe that men and women were created in God's image. They go back to the original passages in Genesis and say, we were both created in God's image. Like, God, God knew what he was doing, that, that both men and women have value, have value to each other and have value to God, um, that, that we all have, no matter what sex we are, salvation through grace, that we are equal as co-heirs with Christ, meaning we, we all, men and women, have that access to Jesus. We are co-heirs, and that all men and women both have gifts to use in the church. 
That is, that is an overarching view for both, okay? Both views don't, don't mean to devalue one or elevate another. Um, it's a different point of view on how those relationships work together. But in the eyes of God, through that filter of loving one another, they both believe these things. That's good. That's good. So where they separate in the complexity of the verses we just read is this. That complementarian view uh, goes to this passage in 2 Timothy and also goes to a passage, I think it's in 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 14, that is very similar to this passage that we just read the, that's controversial. And they say these are prescriptive, that women cannot lead or preach or teach in the church, that it's prescribed, they shouldn't do it. When they do it, they're sinning, and, um, and it's not right, okay? And then they believe that men and women have different and specific roles in marriage and in family, meaning God created men in a very specific way, and, uh, and they're the head of the, the household, and women are to submit to them, and, uh, and then women have a specific role to play, and their role is in, in the home or with the kids or fill in the blank, and, and, and the, the wife is there to complement the husband, right, in, in the role that they play in the family. Now, I'll tell you something. There's nothing wrong with this view. There's good godly people that I know that, that, that that's what they believe. For a long time, this is the way I believe. Now, I'm going to get to what I believe at the end, all right? So you can hear my messy thing, okay? But, but that's what complementarian says. Very specific roles um, and, and how they relate to one another. They, they take that passage that we just read as prescriptive. Women should stay silent in church. Um, they should have no role of teaching or preaching or leading over any other man. That's, that, 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 that is very directly um, what those, those see. And they see a pattern through the Old Testament and the New Testament of male leadership and male leadership in the church. And so they argue that's, that's the pattern that we see all the way from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So that's the pattern that God wants. That's his intended pattern. Okay? So that's the complementarian view of women in general. And then we have the egalitarian view, which goes kind of a different direction. So the egalitarian view says that women can lead, preach, or teach in church. That there is absolute equality. That, that gender is not a bias for leadership or ministry at all. Like, it's all about gifting, and God will use whoever he gifts to do whatever he wants. So that's that in the life of the church is open to whomever— that men and women have mutual leadership in marriage and family. There, there is a difference. There's no headship or submissiveness, or it's mutual submission only. And, uh, and, and so it's really the family relationship is just based upon gift and strength. So whatever role that the husband and wife want to play in their gifts and strength, that's just how it works. That's how they work. Um, and so there's equality. They just think there's absolute equality in the, in the gender roles. Um, and, and, and the patterns of that. Now, the egalitarian view looks at a pattern in the Old Testament and New Testament, and, and they see that there are women who served in leadership, just kind of like a few of the ones that I listed. Um, they look in the Old Testament at Miriam, who was listed amongst Aaron and, and Moses, who led the, um, the, the Israelites out of Egypt. Later in the book of Malachi, he says, and Miriam was one of, that was with them. Interesting. They, they look at people like Deborah, Huldah, Esther, Hannah, Ruth in the Old Testament. Strong women leaders that God used to do great and mighty things. There, were, there was a woman judge and a woman prophet in the Old Testament. So they say, well, there's obviously some exceptions here um, that we see. And then they see a pattern in the New Testament where Jesus elevated. This is the interesting thing with Jesus. Jesus elevated the role of women and children and culture. He was countercultural. Jesus loved messing with people. I wish I could have seen it sometimes, right? Like, like, he showed up at a well in the middle of the day, and this Samaritan woman shows up to get water. And A, Samaritans and Jews, not good. Like, there was racial tension there. Now, man and woman alone together, another tension there. And she is the first one that hears about the gospel, the living water, from Jesus. And he calls her out on all of her stuff. Not only are you home, you've been married, like, a bunch of times, and you're, now you're living with somebody. It's not even, not even your spouse. And she, her eyes get open. And she runs back to her town, says, this, is, this dude knows everything I've done. I think this is him, or the Messiah, and then brings the whole town to Jesus. So she was kind of the first missionary to her own town to bring people to Jesus. 
And so they see people like this. They see that Jesus didn't, he pushed against cultural norms and, and he elevated the role and, and, and ele- elevated and, and loved women equally as he did the prophets and the men and, and, and the disciples and the friendships that he had, the relationships that he had, and with children. Like, it was interesting that scene, we, we, if you have a kid and it usually will come out at some point in Sunday school, that like, all, the kids were coming to Jesus and the disciples were like, get these kids away. Like, get these, because that was a culture norm. Like, kids aren't, they're just useless. Like, get, what are these little rugrats doing around here? Like, that's what the disciples were doing. Like, get them away. And Jesus like, whoa, 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 whoa. Anyone that prevents these little ones to come to me, woe to them. They're mine, right? And he elevates the role of children in relation to him in the culture. That's who Jesus was. Jesus did a pretty good job of loving God and loving others, living it out for us to learn from. And so, so the egalitarian view takes all of that, and they say, but we see these passages, even Paul wrote in honored godly women. So now we have two arguments. Both of them have legitimacy. Both of them have biblical backing. And both of them can be kind of right. Well, now what do we do? We love each other, right? Always through the filter of love. We choose to love one another as we walk through these tensions. Um, I would encourage us to consider Galatians 3. It says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. All of us are. It says, For all of you were baptized into Christ, who have been baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. He says, There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is this picture. And, and I, both views, complementarian and egalitarian, both withhold this passage and say, we are all co-heirs with Christ. Like, no matter what, we're all e- equal. <laughs> we're equal sinners, and we're equally saved by the grace of God, right? Now, the egalitarians would say, yeah, but in there it says there's no longer men or women, right? There's no longer male or female. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer— So they would lean towards, this is, this is my perspective. Complementarians would say, uh, so our perspective is all of us are equal under Christ, yes, but we still have different roles. Now, now this, this tension— this tension that we see, um, there's dangers on both sides. So there's positives on both sides, and then there's, there's, there's dangers on both sides, right? Because I've seen it play out in both directions in unhealthy ways. I've seen now where, where people have taken the complementarian stance that there, there is something um, uh, for men that's different for women in church, in life, and in culture. And they use that then to control abuse and, uh, and, and to sin against. And that's wrong. It's absolutely wrong. Because what that does, it erases the whole co-heirs with Christ thing, right? If now I see you as lesser than, that means I'll treat you as lesser than. And, and, and you're going to be mistreated in the process. Oh, I've been in those churches where, where that view becomes pretty chauvinistic. Like men, are, are, they think they're all that and, and, and a, whatever. And what ends up happening in that process is women are told, listen, the only place you can be is, uh, my wife says it this way, the two Ks, either with the kids or the kitchen. That's the only place you can be, right? Because men are over here, and we're called to lead. We're leading in the home. We're leading in the church. You just stay with the kids in the kitchen. And uh, that gets dangerous. So what do you do with the women in the Scripture that were leaders and who owned businesses and who— who, who showed themselves um, equal to men in society that were then honored in Scripture. Well, they weren't with the kids or in the kitchen. Were they sinning, and then therefore they weren't saved? That's the tension. Do you hear that tension? And, and I'll be honest with you, women in this room, um, you've lived with so much crap in our culture and society. Uh, it was about a year ago, I... This is me getting personal. About a year ago, um, I'd been studying this for a long time. I, I, God put me with a woman who's a strong woman. And I would not be the man I am without the woman that, that is with me, uh, my wife Nikki. And we wrestled because God called both of us into ministry. 
like to lead in ministry and we're a partnership like this is how we operate we always have even before we were dating when we were just friends like we were just partners in ministry that's what we did and uh and so we <laughs> as we grew up and did ministry together in the church there's always been this tension in these two camps it's always existed and it's always created a divide even amongst those that worked with us or worked on staff of the church and it's it, it, it got really tense um, it got really tense, and I'm like, I want to know that I know where God is on this, because I don't want to be outside of God's will with this whole picture of how we work together, how the church works, and what is the role of women. And, and in that journey, and in those studies, and as I was kind of going through it, um, God kind of gave me a grander picture of how mistreated women are in the church. And, um, and it led me to some brokenness like a, a moment where I had to repent before God and say, I was a part of that problem. Because I viewed, I did, I viewed women here. Even though I didn't think I did, even though I thought I was a good guy, that there was this mentality culturally that we lived in that devalued uh, women. And, and I know some of you ladies in the room, you know it. I mean, like, you're like, Tim, you have no idea. And you're right. I, the men in this room, I'll just see, just, you know, there's good men in here that have no idea what you have to go through. They have no idea what it's like to be looked up and down. They have no idea what it's like when a man in the room says something and they're like, eh, I don't know. And then, then the guy says the exact same thing and they go, that's a great idea. And you're sitting there going, did I not say it loud enough? Like, there's something wrong there, culturally. That, uh, that we're missing out on. And I think what happens then in the church is that that view, and you add a passage like that, amplifies an unhealthy culture and devalues women all the more. And I don't know how many churches have abused women and lessened them. I don't think that's godly. I think that completely erases the greatest commandment is to love God and love others. We need to get this right, guys. We need to be a church that says we are equal in the eyes of our Savior. We are co-heirs with Christ. So no matter who we are, what we are, we all have value. We all have input. We all have a word and a voice. We all have gifts. We all have strengths and abilities in the body of Christ. And, and so I, I don't ever want to be a church that goes way over here on the complementarian side. Now here's the other danger. is over here on the egal egalitarian side. Because then what happens is the women that I've seen sway way far to this side now they're pissed off at all the men. And now it becomes like liberal um, feminism, where it's like, well, all the men are stupid, you know, so I'm going to treat them like they're stupid, and we're better. So then it actually swings the opposite direction, and the women are like, so I'm going to fight even harder, and I'm going to fight with a dude, because that's, deal with it, you know? And, and so they go the, like way far to the other side, and, um, and then it becomes unhealthy, just as it was over there, Right? And so there's, there can be this way sway, either direction, that, that is dangerous, that gets rid of that filter, the great commandment, that we cannot go to, okay? That, that we cannot be feministic and then degrade men because they've done it to us for so long. Like, that's, that is unhealthy. That's not godly, and that's not what I believe God calls us to. And so when we get into this passage, um, and, and we get into this tension, especially in these relationships— a, we're going to have unity on the essentials. Amen? The gospel is the gospel. The great commandment is the great commandment. We're going to love each other no matter what. Like, we're going to do those things. Okay? Those are the essentials. When it comes to, to this view of, of women's roles in life and in ministry, we're going to be open-handed and choose to love no matter what. Okay? And, and I mean that for you personally. Uh, uh, some of the men in the room um, some of you grew up in a generation where that was the culture. Men were great, women were here, and the kids were here. I work, you serve, and be sure the kids don't bother me, right? Like, that's, that's kind of a cultural norm for a long, long time. And some of you were those kids that grew up in that household, and now you're trying to earn daddy's approval, and you've got some wounds because of it, okay? So I'm going to share where Tim's at. Is that okay? Where, where, where I've gone in this. Because I... I'm neither complementarian or egalitarian. Those were words made up by man to try to describe and win an argument amongst each other. Like, that's what those words were. 
We don't see those words in, in the Bible. And so when I look at the, the whole T, <laughs> or the consistency through Scripture, um, God has softened my heart big time in this process. Um, I, I believe the Timothy passage was descriptive. I believe the passage in 1 Corinthians, Paul was writing to a specific church in a specific time. And we see the culture in Ephesus in that time was women were trying to lead over the men because that was the religion of the day. These women in the, in the temple worship and Artemis and this, this, this uh, culture that existed was led by women and they were shifting that mentality straight into the church, which was women are better than men. And in that culture of leadership, they were then trying to show themselves off, like, look at me and I deserve position and authority here. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. And so he's describing, he's describing what was happening. He says, so this is what I'm going to say. And it's interesting because a translation can be either women or wives in that passage. It could be women, this is what I say, or wives, this is what I say. So the wife-husband relationship is a very specific one, right? Women in general is now a general statement. Um, but I believe he was getting to the heart and saying, if that is your attitude and you're trying to show off and show up, and be, be better than, you're missing the heartbeat in worship. Because what is worship all about? God. So he's saying, let's get rid of the distractions in this church. Let's get back to God and learning and growing, okay? So that's, that's where I've landed as I've studied the whole team, because then I wrestled with these passages. I'm like, how could Paul, like, the book of Romans, like this long list of these godly women who were leaders in the church, and then say, but I demand them to be quiet. I, I can't, my mind can't wrap around those two things. And so I look at the consistency, and I say, well, I think women can use all the gifts that God's given them, however he's called them to use them, to fulfill the gospel work of Jesus Christ. That's where I've landed. But, now here's the tension. But I believe in the home, A, that we've been called in Ephesians chapter 4 for mutual submission. That's the whole body of Christ. All of us are to submit one to another. And in that passage, Ephesians chapter 4, he says, submit one another. And then he says, as Christ submits to God the Father, husbands submit to Christ, and then wives submit to the husbands. And he's giving lines of authority. He's saying, that's how it works. So I also believe that in the home, that men are supposed to be the spiritual leaders in their household, which I don't see a lot happening, to be honest with you. And that's where you have Lois and Eunice, and you have godly women that step up and lead spiritually when the men don't. Because they have to. I would say, men, step up. Spiritually, lead in your home. Because it says to lead as Christ, and Christ gave himself up for the church. That's a call that is a big one, right? It isn't to now submit to me as I'm the leader over you. Ha ha ha. Superman, right? Like I say, no, no, no. Love as Christ loved the church. You love your wife. That is, a, that is an environment and a culture of mutual submission one to another as you're submitting to Christ. And so I believe that there are God-given roles in the family. So I'm, I'm, I'm like a mutt here, theologically. I'm like, I believe God has gifted all women, and he'll use whoever, whenever, however he wants to. And I wrestle with this because when I, when I look and think about the churches in Africa right now, and I'm hearing all these missionary stories over and over again, and I hear about a woman in, this, in the middle of Africa in a village where there are no Christ followers, missionary comes in, and the, the lead person spiritually in that community is a witch doctor who is a woman, and she is sacrificing animals and even babies in the process of doing her religious duties in their society and culture, and she's the first one that gets saved in that place. Oh, watch out. A witch doctor saved? She's going to be telling some people about Jesus. And now she is the pastor in that church, and she's the one that's bringing the gospel to that community, and she's leading in this, in this small village that had no gospel, and now she's leading in it. I'm sorry, you can't lead. Can you go find a man to lead, please? Do you, do you hear the tension? Like when we think about this culturally around the world, I think about a, a woman that was a pastor in the Dominican I got to see in this um, uh, compassion center. As she was... The, the grandmother of the faith, like, like I think it was Lois, right? That, that she grew up in this church and then was raised in this church and became kind of the, 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 the matriarch of the faith in this body. And she's honored. 
in that role. And I'm like, I can't argue with that. Because I see a church that wouldn't have existed if she wasn't there pastoring and giving what she had. So you hear that tension. Now, now I just told you where I am, okay? And I let you know that's where Tim is. I would encourage you to go on your own journey in this process. Now here at New Hope, as a church, we don't have any women who are pastors or elders. Um, that's been our tradition. And I'm not one that says tradition always has to be, but I need you to know I'm not the final say on those decisions here at the church. That's why we have elders and pastors together. When we wrestle with these passages, one another, like, man, I don't know, this and that. And we wrestle with this every week when we do our preaching team. It's like, well, we read this here and here and here, and we, we struggle with these things. And so we're going to go where the Spirit leads us as we filter through God's Word. And, and I guess what I'm telling you is, our hands are open to God with that in this church, how that's going to work. But I will say this, if you are a woman and, and God's given you spiritual gifts, we're going to do all we can to equip you to use them in this church, okay? And, and that, that's our heartbeat. That's our heartbeat here, okay? The heartbeat in all of it, even Paul's letter to Timothy, even in the words that he said that were like, what is he talking about? His design and desire was unity and faithfulness and love. And we, we, I just want to finish up with this, okay? And then, and then we'll walk through some challenge here, okay? Because, uh, because we, we see first Peter. Peter was an apostle, you know, he was a disciple of, of Christ. And he's talking about the husband and wife relationship. And he says it this way, and I love because he just sums it up for us this morning. He says, you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone, uh, as with someone weaker since she is a woman. And that's not a put down, okay? That is by no means a put down. He says, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. This is an interesting one. Men, mistreat your women. Your prayers have a ceiling. They're not reaching God. That's interesting. Okay. The whole heartbeat is love and honor, right? Co-heirs in the faith. He says, to sum it up, <laughs> all of you, all of us, all of us in this room, all of you, be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, and humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. That's for all of us. We all have inherited a blessing. His name is Jesus Christ. We are all saved by the same blood and sacrifice, brought to new life because of his life, brought to life. And that's what we celebrate overall. Okay? God, this is a, this is a tricky topic. And I pray that your word has been preached this morning and that it hasn't been me and as we wrestle with these type of passages that we would be open-handed as we set our lives on the foundation of the gospel, which is the most important thing. And God, in this time of challenge and response and in a moment as we're going we're gonna to celebrate baptisms together, God, that you just remind us of what you've done for us. And help us, no matter who we are in this room, help us to not be prideful. Teach us humility. Because it's in our humbleness before you and before other people when we actually start to grow and learn and look more like Jesus. And so this morning, if there's something that we need to be humbled in, every single one of us in this room, by the power of your Spirit, just reveal it and convict us of whatever it might be. I just want to take a moment of challenge, and I first want to talk to the women in the room. Number one, if you're a woman and you've been hurt and wounded in a church, or this church, even, and it was specific because you're a woman, I'm sorry. That should have never happened. And it should never happen in church by anybody, and especially by spiritual leadership whose job is to serve and shepherd the flock. I'm, 
I'm going to pray that God would walk you to the other side in, in healing of whatever that is in your life, if that's you. And let Jesus meet you in the midst of that. I love, <laughs> I love the way Pastor Jim talks about this. He's, he's our discipleship pastor. He counsels a lot of people. He talks about God in such a cool way. He says that God is such a gentleman. Like, God isn't, he's not a hammer carrier. He's not Thor. You know, he's not there to beat you up. Like, he's such a gentleman when he meets us. And Jesus is the same way. He says, come to him. His hands are open, okay? And, and, and the challenge for the women in this passage was, was clothe yourself with the good things. Don't worry so much about the external, which is what the world tells you all the time. Worry about the external, what you wear, what you look like, the way your hair is, the, whatever it is. And the challenge is clothe yourself with good deeds and love and faith. Let those be the things that come out of you when people see you. Let that be your character because nobody can argue against those things. Now, let me talk to the men in the room. I'm going to challenge every single man in this room. You need to treat the women in your life as sisters in Christ. Too many men treat other women as property, as tools for their own desire. Um, they treat them as lesser than. They don't honor them. They dishonor them. And I'm saying, if that's you, you need to repent. Because it's sinful. That goes against the greatest command, which is love. <laughs> you need to learn how to love the women in your life as sisters in Christ. How would you want your sister to be treated? <laughs> That's the picture in Christ. They are co-heirs with you. So I'm just, I'm challenging men in the room. Step up and love them. Okay? Value them and honor them. And for all of us in this room, if you've wrestled with a judgmental heart, devaluing others, or pride, yeah, you gotta let that go. Because <laughs> you'll never learn if that's you, if that's your mode of operation, if that's how, you, that's how you live life. You will never learn if you're prideful, judgmental, and you devalue others. And so I'm gonna tell you right now, you just need to confess that to God. Say, God, I'm prideful. I, I've devalued people. Please forgive me and ask him. And then go to the people that you've devalued and confess it to them and restore relationship with some people in your life. And that's both men and women, okay? That, that's all of us in this room. Now, we're going to respond in, in a different kind of way because this isn't a baptism sermon, right? <laughs> but it is a sermon about the centrality of the gospel. It is a sermon about being co-heirs with Christ. And the only way you are a co-heir with Christ is if you've accepted Christ as your Savior. That's it. There's no other way to God. There's no ladder you can climb. There's no way that you can make yourself perfect enough to earn your way to heaven. None of us can make it there. Even on our best day, we fall short of God's glory. And God knew it. That's why he sent Jesus down that ladder from heaven. And Jesus lived, and he walked, and he breathed, and he was perfect. He became the perfect sacrifice on the cross for you and for me. He did what we all deserved on the cross so that we can get what we don't deserve with him in life in eternity. He's been our substitute so that we can be with God. If you have not made a decision for Christ, I'm going to pray in a moment and, uh, and you can start that relationship with him right now, okay? And, and I'm going to talk to everybody in this room. If you've already done that, if you already have a real relationship with Christ, but you've never made that proclamation public, you've never been baptized, we're opening the waters today, okay? And trust me, they're warm. It's like 80 degrees in there, all right? So it's like nice, and we made it pretty, you won't want to get out. It's so heavenly, all right? Um, but we'll hold you down to see Jesus, okay? Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, unless you want us to, it's up to you. Uh, but here's the thing. If you want to take that step today, if you want to be baptized and you want to make that pub pr public proclamation that we talked about last week with Timothy, that Paul was reminding Timothy, you remember the proclamation you made of the gospel in your life? Like, that's what this is. 
And so if you want to take that step, we're going to sing a song. And while we're singing, you can come right backstage over here. This is what we call the prayer room. And uh, my wife, Nikki, will be there to meet you and to walk you through it. We have swimsuits. Uh, we've got shorts and T-shirts. We've got towels. We have everything you need today. If you want to jump into the waters of baptisms, you are welcome to do that if you've accepted Christ. And today, if you want to accept Christ, and today's your starting day, you can get baptized today. That's actually the way we see it in the New Testament. That's what they did. They confessed, they repented, and then they ran to the waters to say, here I am. I'm a part of the family. I'm a co-heir with Christ. And I've been washed clean by his blood. And if you want to do that today, I would encourage you to do it. So I'm going to pray. We're going to respond and worship, okay, this morning. We're going to sing, and we're going to celebrate some baptisms um, this morning. So would you guys stand with me as we take this time to respond? God, I'm grateful for the challenge of your word. I'm grateful that you, um, that your spirit leads and guides and loves. And, and, and God, as we get to this time of response, as we sing and celebrate what Christ has done for us, that Christ is enough. There's nothing else we need. Christ has done everything we need for life, for salvation, for relationship with you. And as we sing and proclaim that, God, I'm going to pray for those this morning that have not started that relationship with you. I'm going to pray that you would wake them up spiritually, that you would start bursting something out of the depths of their heart and their soul, knowing that you are a God of love. You are a God of acceptance. You're a God who draws us in. So during this time of response, whether it's in the waters of baptism or whether it's just in our hearts where we're at, that you would just remind us of what you've done for us. Now this morning, if you want to accept Jesus, you can pray. You can pray to him. And if that's you this morning, you just pray out to God. You can repeat after me, but just make it your own words to him. You say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't be perfect and I can't make it to heaven on my own. And so God, I want to confess Jesus as my savior. Your son paid the price for my sin and I want him in my life right now. Please forgive me. I repent of my life and my sin and my ways and I give you everything, who I am. So enter into my heart, enter into my life. I give you it all. And it's in Christ's name that I ask and pray that. Amen.